got two grandchildren in Wyoming University. Praise God. So we're going to get our to the house. Amen and amen. We're opening our Bibles, beloved, since to 2 Kings. And we're opening, hallelujah, to 2 Kings chapter 13. And as you know, this is the month of Nisan. We had a beautiful celebration here Sunday night for the first uh, month on the biblical calendar. This shall be the beginning of month for you. It is the first month of the year for you. Remember, to you, this is a gift that God gave to his people because all yeah, the dates sorry. on the biblical calendar are dates designated for destiny. They are days that God set aside to be days of breakthrough for you and for me. Now, beloved, I want us tonight, before we look at 2 Kings, to look at one of the most important events that scripture speaks to us about that took place in the first month. And there are many miracles that have happened all throughout the scripture in the first month. See that one of the most important miracles on the first month, in the first month, is found in Genesis chapter 6, verse 13. This is the time when Noah opened the ark and the waters were dried and everything was new. God wants to do a new thing in your life. He wants to dry up the waters of the flood and recreate things around you. Hallelujah. Recreate. Hallelujah. This is a time of recreation after devastation. Some of you have been through some devastating experiences, but God wants to bring recreation and make all things new. Can you just claim that right now? Lord, recreate my destiny. Recreate my purpose. God, recreate things around me. Hallelujah. Break the bondages off. Make all things new. The storm is stopping. You see, Noah's storm represents trials in our life, tribulations in our life. Hallelujah. The world was destroyed around Noah. But on the first day of the first month, the Bible teaches us in the book of Genesis, in the sixth, in the ninth chapter, or excuse me, the eighth chapter in the 13th verse. Hallelujah. Let's look at that for a moment. And we see 813, Genesis 813. Uh, Pastor Sandra is going to read that for us. Hallelujah. That everything became new. Hallelujah. It's just up on the screen. Yeah, God is going to stop storms. Hallelujah. God's going to, it's a new season. You've been in the flood a long time. How many have been in a situation where you've been in a flood for such a long time and you need God to turn things around? This month of Nisan is going to be a time because that's what God ordained it to be in the first month. Let's look at another miracle God did in the first month. I want you to go with me. Hallelujah. To the book of we're looking at Ruth. Let's go to book of Ruth, the first chapter, and we're going to look at the 22nd verse. This is the time when God takes the pain of our past and use it, uses it for purpose. How many of you have had some things happen in your life you don't understand? You're asking God, why, God, did these things happen in my life? I don't understand. The book of Ruth speaks to us about so much loss. We have the loss of Elimelech. He was the husband of Naomi. We have the, the two sons of Naomi. Can you imagine two sons and a husband? What losses? And Ruth, who also lost her husband, but was willing to leave everything to go to the land that she never knew before to go to a people she didn't know before. She had no idea in her acts of kindness that she was going to be so rewarded for that unselfishness that when she got there, God was going to change her destiny. I want you to know that when we perform acts of kindness, when we're going through trials and we care about other people who are going through trials, you know, when we go through trials, it's so easy to think about ourselves only. We just think of our own need, our own wants. We can become consumed with self. But the Bible shows us when
when Ruth lost her own husband, her main concern was Naomi, who lost her husband and her two children. And give everything up, and they both came together to the Holy Land. Notice when the Bible said, in the beginning of the barley harvest, turn to your name on the 15th day of the first month. Come on, that's the 15th day of the first month. Are you with me? That's the 15th day of Nisan. So this means that this was a time when God switched everything for Ruth and Naomi. This is a time of destiny. In 49 days, God changed their whole entire destiny. Are you with me? God can do the same for you because this is the time. This is the supernatural season. There are se secular seasons and there are supernatural seasons. And we have just entered into this month of Nisan where God, hallelujah, is uh, in a biblical sense. This is something very powerful. Are you with me? Let's go tonight so we can understand what we're speaking about to the book of Exodus the 40th chapter. And remember, the, the month of Nisan is also the first month. It's another way of saying the first month. Say it with me, the first month on the biblical calendar. And God gave commandment concerning that first month. All right, we're looking at Exodus chapter 40. I want us to learn some things. This is not... This is not written in the Bible so we know it happened. This is written in the Bible so that we might be directed into destiny. Looking at Exodus chapter 40, verses 1 and 2. The Bible says, And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, read it with me, On the first day of the first month, say it with me, On the first day of the first month, say, That's right now this season. Hallelujah. He said, on the first day of the first month, you will set up the tabernacle of the tent of the congregation. Now, I want to tell you why this is so important to us right now in the year 2024. Because this happened in the month of Nisan. Actually, Sunday night was Rosh Kodesh Nisan, the first day of the first month. But I also want you to know that even though this is the third of Nisan, the principle is still here for the first month. Are you following me? And the Bible says on the first day of the first month, you're going to set up the tent of the congregation or the tabernacle. This is something that we need to do because the new year was beginning. This was a new time for Israel. They left Egypt in the first month. That's why God said you have to consecrate it because it's such a mighty month of miracles that every year when you come to this month, what I did then, I will do again. And so we have to understand that the month was so holy that God set it aside to be a month that would demonstrate God's miraculous power and his power over creation and that's why the red sea split in that month that's why the children of israel left egypt that first month that's why god miraculously delivered them out of the hand of for 400 years in that month are you following me but now this is a year later they're setting up the tabernacle this is written so that we would learn how to have a successful year and come into the promises of God with God's anointing behind our year. God is showing us the first priority of the whole year was to set up the tabernacle. Are you hearing me? That means the most important thing if we're going to get our lives in order is to put the kingdom first. That if we are going to put our lives in order and get our lives in the order of God and be able to walk in the miraculous, the supernatural secrets in God's word is telling us we have to put God above all things and put the tabernacle and the kingdom above all things. So the scripture protocol. 
Say it with me, protocols of power. How many of you want a life in divine order? You don't want confusion anymore. You want your life to come into a place of divine order. So then that means what this whole narrative of Exodus 40 is about is about protocol. Are you following me? He is going to, this is very unique. Let me tell you something about the, the setting up of the tabernacle. The setting up of the tabernacle is told to us in Exodus 40, chapter, uh, verse, chapter 40, verses 1 to the end. And then the setting up of the tabernacle is also given to us in another version. It's given to us in the book of Numbers in the seventh chapter. Then it is also given to us in the Leviticus version. The Leviticus version is Leviticus chapter 9. All right? So you say, why does the Bible go through all this detail on the setting up of the tabernacle? What does that have to do with my life? And then we can say, why are there three versions? Isn't there one version enough? All right? Each version tells us something that we didn't get from the other version. Tells us something about the anointing and the presence of God. And how to, um, why this is so important and why it's in three places is because it's going to affect the destiny of Israel. The whole reason for delivering them out of bondage was the tabernacle. You see, the tabernacle represents what they were born for. The tabernacle represents that if they have the tabernacle, they have God's presence among them. And if you're going to the promised land without God's presence, you will not be able to inherit what God has for you. So the whole thing was how to capture the presence of God, how to live in the presence of God, so that God's plan can be accomplished in our lives. Are you with me? Do you understand this, dear ones? So the whole purpose of coming out of Egypt, God has promises for them. The promises are given. Let's go to Exodus chapter 6. I want you to see the promises God gave to the children of Israel when they came out of Egypt. Because these are promises for the month of Nisan. These are promises for the first month. I don't know about you, but I like to claim them. I need them for my life. Turn to your neighbor and say, every promise in the Bible is mine. Not some, all. Put your hands up and say, I want all the promises. Because Jesus died on the cross to give me every promise. And I want every promise that he died on the cross to give me. Amen. Let's look just for a moment. Exodus 6 verse 5. From verses 5 through 8, you are going to see why God delivered the children of Israel. Notice, he said, I've heard the groaning of the children of Israel, whom the Egyptians keep in bondage. The Egyptians represent not just a people that keep them in bondage, but a stronghold spirit that keeps them in bondage. That means when we say coming out of Egypt, the Bible is using the language loosed out of Egypt. There's a difference. There's a difference between leaving Egypt and being let go out of Egypt. You may say it's the same thing. You may say, leaving Egypt, what's the difference between being let go out of Egypt and leaving Egypt? There's a huge difference. Say with me, there's a huge difference. Being let go out of Egypt means that some demonic power has to let you go that's kept you in Egypt for all your life. Somebody ought to say tonight... I'm getting let go out of Egypt. God said, let my people go that they may serve me. Hallelujah. All right, we see let my people go that they may serve me in Exodus. Uh, we're, all, we're here in Exodus 6, so I don't want to lose it. But Exodus chapter 8, verse 1. Really quickly. So that you understand there's a difference between leaving Egypt and being let go out of Egypt. 
say it with me. God, I'm being let go out of my Egypt. Somebody should praise God. This is a month of deliverance. Say this with me. The first month on the biblical calendar. It's a month to be free. It's a month of freedom. It's a month of deliverance from old spirits. It's a month of deliverance from the house of bondage. It's a month of deliverance from Egypt-like bondage. And tonight is your night for deliverance. Exodus 8 1 and the Lord spoke to Moses and said go unto Pharaoh and say unto him everyone say it thus saith the Lord read it that they may serve me hello I said you're getting free so you can serve God you're not getting free so you can be in the world. You're getting free so you can serve the Lord. Hallelujah. Let my people go that they may serve me. Are you with me, beloved? Go with me, please, to Exodus chapter 5, verse 1, uh, because we need uh, Exodus 6 in a moment. But Exodus 5, verse 1. We see the same narrative over and over again. I'll show you two. Hallelujah. I'll show you two. And then we'll go. So you understand leaving Egypt is not the same as being let go out of Egypt. Being let go is the language of the book of Exodus. Are you following me? When Jesus called Lazarus back from the grave, he said, loose that man and let him go. Notice, afterward, Moses and Aaron went in and they told Pharaoh and said, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, what? Let my people go. Why? They may hold a feast unto me in the wilderness. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Are you with me? So say this with me. I have to be let go out of Egypt. All right. Egypt, for the sake of those who are new and never been through Passover time with us before, the word Egypt in Hebrew is the word Mitzrayim. Say it, Mitzrayim. Mitzrayim is a plural word. Say it with me. It's a plural word. Okay, the, the suffix, I am in English, but the suffix tells us it's plural. Mitzrayim. Say it with me, Mitzrayim. Now, I want you to know, Mitzrayim translated from Hebrew to English is Egypt, but Egypt is not just a place. Egypt in Hebrew is a concept because Hebrew is the most articulate language. Every word has a concept behind it. Even the letters have a concept behind it. So how do we find the concept of Mitzrayim? We have to look at the root of the Hebrew word. And the root of the word is Metzar. Say it with me, Metzar. Metzar means narrow place. And there's another word hidden in that word, Sar. And I want you to understand it has multiple meanings. It can mean adversary. It can mean depression. It can mean oppression. It can mean heartache. It can mean sorrow. It can mean affliction. Are you with me? These are the various types of Mitzrayim. Are you hearing me? Mitzrayim in your body. Mitzrayim in your mind. Mitzrayim with your children. Hallelujah. Mitzrayim in your soul. Mitzrayim in your soul means that your soul is in a place of great affliction. It's in a place that you feel it's being pulled down. Mitzrayim in your mind is depression. You can't break out of it. You're stuck there. But tonight, God wants to from that place of staying stuck and bringing you into the blessings God has for you. All right. So God has made a promise to the Bani Israel, to the children of Israel, looking at Exodus chapter 6. And I want you to see these promises because these are your promises as well. 
You know, the Bible tells us in Ephesians chapter 2 that because of Christ, we've become partakers with Israel. Hallelujah. Before Christ, we were strangers to the covenants of promise. We were aliens without God, having no hope in the world. We were considered Gentiles before Christ. But now, because of Christ, we have access to every promise gave, is God gave Israel. But we must understand we don't take the place of Israel. We receive the promises of Israel, but we don't take the place of Israel. That is a heresy. That is not of God. Replacement theology. Are you with me, saints? Okay. So let's look at what the Bible is saying in Exodus chapter 6, verse 5. I have heard the groaning of the children of Israel whom the Egyptians keep in bondage. And I have remembered my covenant. Wherefore, say to the children of Israel, I am the Lord your God. Here's the first promise. I will bring you out from under the burden of Mitzrayim. Say this with me. He's going to bring me out from the burden of Mitzrayim. In my mind, in my body. You see, there's all kinds of Mitzrayim. For the children of Israel, there was social Mitzrayim. There was psychological Mitzrayim. There was physical Mitzrayim. Are you following me? And there was spiritual Mitzrayim. The, the social Mitzrayim was the fact that they were made slaves and that there was an ideology set up by Pharaoh to put them in slavery to degrade them and to take away their liberty. Are you with me? And God is saying, I will bring you out from under the burden of the Egyptians, number one. Number two, I will rid you of their bondage. Are you ready to be rid of the bondages of Mitzrayim? Put your hands up and say every Mitzrayim. Say that the cycle is stopping. Say it right now. Say the cycle is stopping. The devil cannot keep doing what he's done to my family year in and year out. The, the stronghold is over. It's broken tonight. Are you with me? All right. I will rid you from their bondage. I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and great judgments. That means God delivered the children of Israel with great plagues. Okay, great plagues he brought on the enemies. And he delivered them. Now watch this. I will take you unto me for a people. This is where the nation of Israel was born. The nation of Israel was not born in Israel. The nation of Israel was born in the furnace of affliction in Egypt. It was God's will. Are you with me? Now, that doesn't mean it wasn't promised to them before. God is fulfilling a promise that he gave to Abraham 429 years earlier. Are you following me? But this is... God's will was to form a people of greatness. Genesis chapter 46, verses 1 through 3. The Lord said to, the Bible says that the Lord appeared to Israel in visions of the night. He appeared to Jacob. Whenever the Bible uses Jacob's name as Israel, that means it's going to affect the whole nation. Because Jacob's name, when it was changed to Israel, represents his seed. His seed is Israel, and the land God promised him is Israel. All right, so God changed his name from Jacob to Israel. And the Bible says, And the Lord appeared to Israel in visions of the night and said, Fear not to go down to Mitzrayim. For there I will make of you a great nation. I'm going to make a people of greatness in the fiery furnace. Say this with me. I didn't realize that my fiery furnace is making me a person of greatness. Hallelujah. You come out of the fire because God is making a people of greatness that have come out of the fire. And the Bible says, then 
I am the Lord that brought you out from under the burden of Egyptians. So the first one is deliverance from bondage this month. Say, I'm claiming it. The second one, hallelujah, is that God is promising he's taking us unto himself. Say, greater relationship with the Lord than I've ever had before. Third promise. The Lord says, I will bring you into the land. Say, this is the land, the month. I'm coming to my promised land. Say, I'm coming into my promised land. Come on. I'm coming into my promised land. Somebody ought to praise God. I will bring you into the land. Hallelujah. Which I swore to give to Abraham, Isaac, and to Jacob. Now, I want you to know, all throughout the Exodus narrative, you will constantly see the names Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob so that you understand something. The whole reason all these promises are given was not because Israel, the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob were, were just like these impeccable people. They weren't. They sunk down to the 49th level of depravity. It is because God's faithfulness to the forefathers. The forefathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, he promised them. And God is fulfilling what he promised. Say this with me. This is a month that after long waiting, God will fulfill his promise. Say it with me. The not yet has become the already. Things I was waiting for that are not yet promises that I've been holding on to that were not yet say have become the already in this month somebody should praise God we're coming out of the not yet into the already tell your neighbor no more wait I'm in the already I'm claiming it I'm claiming it come on I'm claiming it Somebody should praise the Lord and give God the glory. All right. So we see so many miracles in this month of Nisan. So you're saying, well, why? What about this tabernacle thing? What about the tabernacle? It was set up a year after. I want you to understand the tabernacle has every destiny. Because one of the primary objectives of Moses when he wrote Exodus was to show you from the very beginning that your pain has a prophetic destiny to it. Say this with me. I have a prophetic destiny assigned to my personal pain. See, when you're going through something that's so painful, you can't see a prophetic destiny at all, can you? It's so hopeless. When you're going through loss, for the children of Israel, the Bible, the narrative begins with a prophetic destiny. All right, let's go to Exodus chapter 1 in the slavery narrative. And I want you to see the prophetic destiny that Moses begins to show us. Because there is a prophetic destiny assigned to your trials. Turn to your neighbor and say, I'm not going through this for nothing. My pain will produce profit. Somebody should give God the glory. Exodus chapter 1 verse 1. Now, these are the names of the children of Israel, which came into Israel, which came into Egypt. Every man with his household came with Jacob. Did y'all see that? All right. Let's go down to verse eight. Now, there arose verse eight. Now, there rose up a new king over Egypt who knew not Joseph. Hmm. Watch verse nine. And he said to his people, he's already putting propaganda into the minds of the people so he can propose his plan of programmatic genocide. Programmatic genocide doesn't happen overnight. 
programmatic genocide means this is premeditated. This is something we've already done. Okay, we've got this huge plan, and this is exactly what Pharaoh wanted to do. He didn't want to just enslave the people to have slaves. He enslaved them for cruelty, for cruel bondage. Are you hearing me? So he is now inculcating the entire society with his propaganda. And he said, behold, the children of Israel are more and mightier than we. Verse 10. Come on, let us deal wisely with them. Lest it come to pass when there falls out any war that they join with our enemies and fight against us and get them up out of the land. Let me explain what this means. He is telling them that they are a threat. So we have to deal wisely with these people. They're a threat to our national security. Because what they can do is they can join with our enemies because there's so many. And they can get fight against us and get them out of the land. Notice they're going to fight against us. One thing the Pharaoh spirit wants to do is to make you stop fighting. I said stop fighting. I'm not talking about fighting with each other. I'm talking about the enemy does not want you to keep your fight to say, I'm going on. The enemy wants to take your fight so that you don't fight for your dream. The enemy wants to take your fight so you cannot say, I'm better than this. I know God created me for something else. Hello, somebody. Have you ever been in a place of depression so strong that you... That you said it's useless. I don't need that. This is who I am. I'm not going to even try to change. This is the way my life is. I'm stuck here. That is a lie from the pit of hell. God wants to give you your fight back. And if you got your fight back, then you know that you're getting ready to get delivered. And somebody ought to say, I'm not putting up with the enemy another year. Hallelujah. See, the enemy doesn't want you to have fight. He wants you to sit down and take it when he tells you die and just give it up. And he says there's no hope. This is the way things are, and you're going to be like this for the rest of your life. There's no hope. You're never coming out. You're stuck in Mitzrayim for the rest of your life. But you see, the Lord has other plans. And God so places your personal pain. We serve a God who validates us. God doesn't say shove it under the carpet and pretend it doesn't exist. We don't have a God who says your pain is irrelevant. We don't have a God who says just, you know, do this and just get over it. We don't have a get over it God. We have a God, and this is what the narrative is all about and why it's so beautiful. We have a God who says, I know your pain, I validate it. We have a God who says, your pain is so validated. A God who gives validation, but also gives valuation to your pain. That means God puts a price tag on your pain. He says it's precious to me. And God says there's a prophetic destiny behind your pain. Somebody ought to praise God. Look at the way Moses begins to show us this prophetic destiny. Notice the next verse. The next verse, therefore, they did set over them taskmasters to afflict them with their burdens. And they built for Pharaoh treasure cities, Petom and Ramses. When you look at that, you'd say, what kind of a prophetic destiny is that? They're going to build for Pharaoh treasure cities, Petom and Ramses? I mean, come on. But I want you to know, 
The real name for those treasure cities was not treasure cities. The real word for those treasure cities was storage cities. So why is Moses calling them treasure cities? Does Moses have another agenda? He's not calling them storage cities. He's calling them treasure cities. Do you know why? Because Moses is telling us this is where they built their treasures in the spirit. In the places of their deepest pain became the places of their greatest gain and future. God already knows what you're going through. And you may not know it. It may be darkness to you. But God says, I will bring you, give you treasures out of darkness and the hidden riches of secret places. So it's not, it's not a storage city. They're treasure cities where the children of Israel are building up treasures in the sight of God. You can't see it right now. Turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. I want you to understand you can't see it right now, but it works for you a far more exceeding eternal weight of glory. God is proving to you that your pain has an assignment on it. It's got a prophetic destiny. Somebody ought to say what I've been through has a prophetic destiny attached to it. God's going to use glory. God's going to use it exceedingly and abundantly above all that I can ask or think. Hallelujah. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, looking at verse 17. Verse 17. Hallelujah. But our light affliction is but for a moment. Turn to your neighbor and say, child, it doesn't feel so light right now. And turn to your neighbor and say, it's not for a moment. It's been going on a long time. But God is saying, Compared to where he's bringing you, it's going to be a moment. Compared to what God's going to do with the trials and the tribulation. Compared to what, hallelujah, kind of an assignment is attached to your pain. God's going to take it somewhere you never imagined. Our light affliction is but for a moment. But watch this. But it worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. Say, my suffering is working on my behalf. Hallelujah. Say this with me. It's not my destiny to stay stuck in this storm forever. I am coming out of this. But when I come out, I'm not coming out empty. I'm coming out with some stuff. I'm coming out with destiny. I'm coming out with purpose. I'm coming out with a new assignment. I'm coming out with a favor of God. Somebody ought to give God the praise. Watch this. Go with me to Exodus chapter 3, verses 21 and 22. See, we see this all throughout the narrative. I want you to see Moses has a theme in the narrative that keeps, do, it keeps building itself up. He's building up a family of texts. Say it, he's building up a family of texts. Because we're looking at his prophetic agenda. His prophetic agenda is not just to tell us the slavery narrative. His prophetic agenda is to teach us God uses our pain for gain in the kingdom. Hallelujah. Go with me to Exodus 3, verses 21 and 22. This is the appearing of the angel speaking to Moses through the burning bush. And the Bible, this is God speaking to Moses. And he says, 
I will give this people. This is God telling Moses what's going to happen. I'm going to use you to bring them out, and I'm going to bring them out, and this is what's going to happen. I'm going to give this people favor in the sight of the Egyptians. And it will come to pass that when you go out, you're not going out empty. Now, that word empty in the Hebrew language is the word rakam. Rakam. That means not without cause or purpose. All these years, they've been slaves with no purpose. All these years, the same day, the same week, the same month, with no, nothing but existence. All they knew was the lash of the whip on their back. All they knew was hardship and de despair. All these years. But God said, part of the redemption is to also redeem your purpose. Part of the redemption of coming out of Egypt isn't just physically coming out of Egypt. It's redeeming your destiny as well. It's redeeming your purpose. It's redeeming your calling. Somebody ought to say, I'm coming out of Mitzrayim, and God is redeeming my destiny in the process. When you come out, you're not coming out empty. Say, I'm not coming out of this season in my life empty. Watch this. But every woman, verse 22, shall borrow of her neighbor. This can be a bit confusing because the word borrow is in English, but it actually means in Hebrew request. Petition, not borrow and not pay back. Every woman shall petition of her neighbor and of her that sojourns in her house. Jewels of silver and jewels of gold and raiment. In other words, you're going to go up before the night before they leave Egypt. God says, pizzazz, this is what's going to happen. You are going to go to your neighbor and say, excuse me. Uh, do you have any of these jewels available? Can I have some of those jewels over there? Somebody? Yes. I just need these jewels. Thank you. Give me a handful. Okay, is there more? Okay, great. See all these jewels? The night before they left Egypt, the Lord says, this is what's going to happen. Moses is being notified of this one year in advance. But Abraham was told the same thing 429 years to this. That when your seed comes out of Egypt, you're coming out with great substance. Say this with me. I'm coming out with substance. I'm coming out with substance. So they would say, excuse me, ma'am. I've been working in your house now for 30 years. I please have that gold on your on your arm? Of course you can have the gold. They don't know they're leaving Egypt that night. And neither does the Egyptians know. But now the Egyptians are starting to fear them because their God is defending them. Hello? And excuse me, ma'am. Would you mind terribly? I've been working in your house for 35 years. And, of course, you never paid me one day. <laughs> Would you mind? Could I please have that gold around your neck? Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Okay. And, ma'am, would you mind? Uh, I've been going through this for a long time. I really love that beautiful gold armband that you have. Can I have it? Of course you may have it. Okay. This happened all throughout the land of Egypt so that the Egyptians took off all their gold. Oh, my goodness. They took it all off. All the gold. All the gold. It's not over, sweetie. All the gold. 
all the going. Mama Claire, all the going. And all the same. Woman of God, all the going. All the same. We're taking it out of Egypt. I need some more. I need some more. Hallelujah. Come on, pray in the Holy Ghost. You're not leaving empty. You're not going out empty. There's a purpose behind it. It's got a prophetic depth. No, this one's attached to two. So God's saying double for your shame. Hallelujah. Oh, God, yes, 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 yes. Oh, my goodness. Give this whole row. Right here. Double for your shame. Double for your shame. Double for your shame. Oh, honey, double for your shame. God, I give you praise. Double for your shame. You're taking it out of Egypt, sir. You're taking it out of Egypt. Oh, God, I don't know what you all have been through. I don't know what you've been through, but God knows what you've been through. God knows how painful the months have been. God knows the loneliness. God knows the feeling of burden that you've had for so long. Somebody give Brother Michael one. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Hallelujah. We give you praise. We give you glory. We give you praise. We give you glory. You're taking it out. Yes. Hallelujah. Oh, God. Are you hearing this? Double for your shame. Hallelujah. Glory. Hallelujah. Now, I want you to see this. This is what's so special. I'm so glad I got to give it to my beautiful granddaughter because everything we go through, it's laid up for our children and our children's children. I said everything we go through is laid up so we can secure the fact that God is going to bless our seed because we have served God. Hallelujah. Somebody ought to praise the Lord and give him glory. We need this whole row. In just a minute, we're going to give more. Now, beloved saints, he said, you're going to borrow every woman of her neighbor and of her that soldiers in her house, jewels of silver and jewels of gold and raiment and put it on your sons and your daughters. Hallelujah. And you will spoil the Egyptians. Now, you know what's very unusual, and we're going we're gonna to pray in a minute. Do you know what is so unusual is they weren't jewels. They were jewelry. Now, I want to tell you what the, the word is in Hebrew. It's not jewelry. Because jewelry in Hebrew or jewels are segula in Hebrew. It's not segula. It's the word kalim. Can you say that with me? Kaleem. Kaleem is very important. Kaylee knows because she got a prophetic word that has her name in it. Kaleem. Kaleem is what they will become. Those jewels of, of silver and gold are going to be melted down in the wilderness. Now, they get to keep 90% of it. They're going to offer it to God as an offering. And it's going to be melted down in the wilderness and become the very vessels in the tabernacle that God is going to make them the Ark of the Covenant. God is going to make them the table of showbread. God is going to make them the instruments that bring the presence of God to Israel in Egypt, uh, in the wilderness. So that means your suffering, because that was God's recompense. Say it with me. Divine compensation for all my tribulation. Okay, what's compensation? Has anybody here ever gotten a compensation check? Maybe they needed a bigger one. They just got a little one. 
say, gosh, they should have given me some more comp, but they didn't. Oh, there's nothing worse than really, really like Maria over here in Jesus name. Come on, pray right now. Maria over here. The compensation that belonged to your husband that you are fighting for. We declare and decree the compensation is yours in the name of Jesus. Maria, let me give you an example. Maria came to the 5 a.m. prayer meetings all the time before COVID. And her husband came too, and he's in heaven now. And there was a huge a huge case for his workman's comp. And she's still fighting it. And she can get it. And we're believing God she's going to get it. <laughs> Hallelujah. But there's nothing like having been somewhere and not being treated appropriately or having injury. So, see, compensation is workman's comp or comp is to... Help somebody that's been gone through an injury of some sort. Everyone here has been through injuries, whether they're physical, emotional, or spiritual. And you know the God that you serve is a God who wants to give you some compensation for all your tribulation. You wonder why you see some of these individuals and there's no reason really for their, for their blessing or their, you know, astronomical blessings that God puts in their lives. But they're Christians. Many times you look at their background and it's just their heavenly father compensating them. For what they went through when they were a child. It's divine compensation. You see, we serve a father who loves you so much, who knows what you've been through, knows the pain and the agony, and he has compensation. And that compensation, he gave the children of Israel jewels of silver, jewels of gold. He had to raise them up to get them out. He didn't let them come out as slaves. He had them come out, raised up, elevated in their status. They came up with a higher status socially than the Egyptians. They became higher than their enemies. You see, when they were slaves in Egypt, their Egyptian uh, rulers ruled over them and degraded them, belittled them, withheld from them the, the wages they deserved, withheld from them. Their own dignity degraded them down and made them feel less than human beings. But when they left Egypt, they left at the highest level socially. They left at a place full of riches. I hope you hear this. And the reason was because God had a prophetic destiny on those riches. It represents the compensation. This is why it's so precious to the Lord. It represented their tears. It represented their years of tears in Egypt. And God is saying, that's the silver I want in my tabernacle. That's the gold you're going to use for the Ark of the Covenant. Are you following me? So their sorrow had a prophetic destiny on it to build so that God would hallelujah say what I've been through is going to help somebody feel the presence of God it's going to help somebody come into the place of God's presence stand to your feet right now and give God the glory right now hallelujah stand to your feet and give him praise oh God we praise you tonight we praise you for your glory. We praise you for what you're doing in the house tonight. We praise you because you're faithful. We praise you because you're good. Divine compensation for all the tribulation. A prophetic assignment to your suffering. 
When you're going through it, you can't see it. And some of you right now are saying, God, how long? I've been waiting. How long? God has his timing. God's going to open the door. Hallelujah. It's not worthy to be compared. Hallelujah. It's not worthy to be compared with the glory that shall be revealed in you, Sister Tony. It's not worth it. I tell you, if you look back after where God's bringing you, and you look back on these days, these days that you suffered are going to say, it happened so quick, God brought me out so quickly. But I wouldn't have traded it for anything because the Lord revealed himself to me in these hours. Hallelujah, the Lord revealed himself to you. But it's not going to hurt anymore. It's going to pass away. And somebody should give God the glory. This is the month of Nisan. God's promises to you this month. Put your hands up right now and say this with me. Father God, I want to give you praise. That in the name of Jesus, you're bringing me up and you're bringing me out. Oh, Karabashanda, now just raise him right now for the prophetic destiny on your purpose. For God's going to bring some of you into ministry. And the very people that you're ministering to are going to be people that have been through what you've been through. Hallelujah. God's going to give you gifts of the Holy Spirit. You're going to be operating under the anointing. Hallelujah. You're going to be highly favored on the job. Hallelujah. You're going to be the head and not the tail. You're going to be above and not beneath. The Lord said to Israel, you will be above only. Hallelujah. Say my new position from divine compensation. Because my father saw when my enemies were triumphing over me that I will be the head and not the tail. It's my destiny to be the head and not the tail. Hallelujah. Somebody should shout the victory. We thank you, Lord. Say this with me. In Jesus' name, I receive it tonight. For the glory of God. Oh, God, I give you praise. Oh, God, I give you praise. Just another moment of interceding just for everyone. Just another moment of praying. Woman of God, tonight's your night. Woman of God, this is your word tonight. He brought you here tonight. Just special. This is your night. You're getting double for your shame. God's opening the doors of destiny. He's going to take your pain. He's got an, a prophetic assignment on it. Hallelujah. A prophetic destiny on that pain. For the glory of God, sweetie, a prophetic destiny over your, 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 your past. Hallelujah. A prophetic purpose over your past. It's going to bring forth great glory to God, sweetie. Great glory to God. Hallelujah. Great glory to God. Hallelujah, Rachel. Great glory to God, sweetie. Great glory to God, woman of God. Great glory to God. Hallelujah. Jesus, I thank you. Great glory to God. Great glory to God. Great glory to God. Great glory to God. I give you praise. Great glory to God. Hallelujah, Marlene. Great glory to God. Hallelujah, Raylena. Great glory to God. Great glory to God, Kathy. Great glory to God for the glory of the kingdom. Hallelujah. And for this precious brother. Great glory to you, sweetheart. Great glory to God with your pain. Hallelujah. Give God the praise and the glory. Great glory. Great glory. Great glory for the glory of God. Hallelujah. Great for the glory of God. Hallelujah. Great, 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 great for the glory of God. Somebody ought to praise the Lord tonight and give God the praise. Hallelujah. A prophetic destiny assigned to your personal pain. It's not for nothing. It's going to be used for the glory of God. Nothing is going to be gone. I give you praise double for her shame. Devil, you're a liar. 
get your hands off the Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Oh, beloved, before we end tonight, I want to show you something very precious. It's, a, it's, it's, it's not the best quality. It's actually quality from S South Sudan. One of our pastors from Sudan that we're bringing in, I want you to hear what he has to say. All right, so you can understand why this conference is so unique. We're hand-selecting pastors also from Sudan itself. I'm so excited about it. If it wouldn't be a danger to the Christians in Sudan, we would have gone into Sudan to have the conference ourselves but it would be a danger for the Christians living there. So we don't want to endanger them. So they're coming to us 